Okay, uh, I think how about let's uh, get started. So my name is Jia Wang, ice climatologist here. Today, uh, it's, it's my honor or our honor uh, to, uh, to have uh, Professor Paul Ruber of University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, uh, distinguished a professor uh, 10 years ago. So his, he got education, bachelor degree in at McGill University, and then went back to uh, MIT for his uh, master, and then again back to uh, McGill for your PhD. So his uh, uh, PhD supervisor is uh, Jack Kam. Jiang Jiang Kam also the uh, I think distinguished professor uh, from MIT, and <clears throat> Paul's uh, expertise in asymptotic meteorology, weather, and forecasting. So he has served the associate editor and editor of weather and forecasting and also a source editor on, uh, in uh, Monthly Weather Review. So he's not only uh, did the dynamic, dynamic uh, forecasting uh, of the weather and forecast uh, weather and synoptic meteorology uh, recently, and he applied uh, AI or machine learning uh, to the uh, forecasting of meteorology and also the uh, water water level and other uh, cyclogenesis as well. So he has served the American Meteorology Society Standing Committee of AI. Uh, so I think that we will take this opportunity uh, uh, because our girl Sigla just started to use machine learning to uh, to, to study uh, our great lake. However, we just are beginner. So I think we should take this opportunity for Paul's uh, talk and discussion and to promote our research using uh, machine learning. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thanks for that introduction and thanks for the invitation to talk to you. So I understand uh, in talking to folks that this is the 50 year anniversary of Goral and sitting right there is Dave Schwab. Didn't do all 50 years, but a lot of them. Yeah. And Dave is a great connection because that's how I first got involved at very early stages of my career. We had a, a research project. It was my first NSF grant actually. And I worked a lot with Dave doing uh, Lake Michigan current modeling. So it was really nice to develop those connections and they served me well, got me into a lot of numerical weather prediction work that I did after that. So it's a really good connection to Glural that way. So you'll notice this weird looking creatures on the first page of this talk. And it's because I will be talking about one particular application of machine learning, which is an adaptive approach, which I think has a lot of application for the kinds of post-processing things that we often do in atmospheric sciences. I will say that, that my title is a little bit of misleading because it's really mostly about atmospheric sciences that I'm gonna be talking about rather than other physical sciences, just because I'm an atmospheric scientist. I was told the keys would work, but they don't. Clicking on it. Oop, now I want to go back now. There we go. All right, so I just wanted to mention, this is a graph that Amy McGovern uh, gave to me and just basically showing uh, machine learning activity in uh, the AMS annual meeting. It stops in 2021, but anybody who's been to one recently knows that this curve has just continued to go up. So just really rapid growth and interest in AI and machine learning in the atmospheric sciences and for good reason. There's a, it's a, essentially a, a point of exploration in our field. We don't know exactly what the best 
approaches for using it and what the best methods are. And so it's really a very research active point in our history, but with a lot of uh, potential. I'm also going to be talking about agent-based models, which is something that's of less uh, application right now in atmospheric sciences, but is growing in interest. And basically, the idea is very different from what we're used to in atmospheric sciences. In this case, instead of having uh, a system of equations, let's say partial differential equations, to just describe the evolution of a system, we have that evolution described by interaction of individual agents. And they follow a set of local rules, not sort of governing rules. And the, the behavior of the system emerges from those local interactions. So it's very much a bottom-up kind of evolution. And it actually uh, fits in a lot of different kinds of contexts. A, a good example is traffic flow. So if you think about traffic flow, traffic engineers uh, often model it as partial differential equations. But of course, we all know from traffic, even in a traffic jam, they're not continuous fluids. It's individual vehicles that are interacting following local rules that produces that overall traffic flow behavior. And there are a lot of other applications where that makes sense as well. I've used it in post-processing applications for atmospheric science. And this is strange to us being uh, our, our history coming from apes. And if you're some sort of weird person who doesn't believe that, we can have that conversation later. But anyway, so basically because of that primate uh, history, we sort of view things as having some leader who tells everything else how to follow. And so when you look at geese flocking, for example, you might think that's what's happening. The lead goose is telling all the other geese what to do, but in fact, it's not. It's the interaction of each goose following particular local rules that produces this flocking behavior. And this has been shown in some mathematical studies of this. So where's this idea been applied? A lot of different uh, disciplines, biology, uh, for example, in the last uh, application I talked about, traffic, uh, business, organizational theory. So if you want to think about universities, it's all the individuals in the university that are interacting. So a lot of different applications. In atmospheric sciences, it's the social science dimension primarily. Uh, so if you're talking about communication or response to risks and things like that, agent-based modeling is a good way of actually looking at how things go, let's say, from the forecast to the reaction to that forecast and the communication of that forecast. Uh, I'm not going to go through the traffic modeling stuff other than just to show you an example. This is a model that I built a number of years ago. And basically on the x-axis, it's only five minutes of time. On the y-axis, it's four kilometers of road. It's one road. And so those upward slanting colored, red colored dots represent vehicles that are moving at full speed. And then where you see these sort of a gray kind of features, that's where you have the traffic jams, traffic slowdowns. These can happen through some sort of random, just perturbation in an individual uh, vehicle. And as a result of that, these can persist long after that particular thing happened. And we've all seen this. You've been on a roadway and everything slows down and you're looking for where the accident is or something like that and you don't ever see it. Because whatever it was that caused it has long since been cleared away. And that's uh, just one of the non- trivial emergent behaviors the traffic has which comes about through this individual agent interaction so you can get very complex behaviors out of that so where i used it was in a concept that was actually first discussed in the 1960s but not really developed because the computing power wasn't really there called evolutionary programming which essentially says we're going to use the principles of evolution to evolve algorithms and so basically you start from some sort of in my case i used an interpretive interpretable algorithm structure so a bunch of if then uh, lines and the reason for doing that is because as a former forecaster between my uh, masters and and phd times at mit and mcgill i actually spent five years as an operational forecaster for a private company in canada and so uh I understood that a lot of the kinds of problems that we deal with are conditional. So for example, if you think about uh, overnight minimum temperatures, when there's a snow cover or where there's light winds or other kind of strongly radiative conditions, that's conditional. You don't always get that 
dew point crash situation is conditional on those other characteristics. And I found it's really hard to produce that same behavior with the multiple linear regression technique because it gets swamped out by most of the times when that's not happening. And so you don't really see a response to fresh snow cover that you actually see in real world conditions if you have that sort of conditional structure. So that's how I set that up. It also leads to interpretable equations, which is also a nice feature. But basically you start off with this initially random structure. That's the overarching structure, but what the coefficients are, what the variables are, all of that uh, is initially random. And then you measure the success or fitness of each one of those algorithms. And so the evolution is each algorithm is one agent within that system, that ecosystem. And you measure the success or fitness of those algorithms. All of them are really bad, but some of them are less bad than the others. And so those are the ones that produce the next generation. And within about 20 generations or so, you get uh, algorithms that are competitive with multiple linear regression. And after that, you get better solutions. So it actually evolves relatively quickly. You just keep repeating that process. Eventually, you reach some sort of saturation point, and you can't improve much beyond that, the limit of predictability, given the data that you have. So that's the idea. So it's an agent-based model, because it's those algorithms are agents. Uh, then I later thought a bit more, so I'm not an ecosystem biologist by any means, but I did some reading and they talked about the, the idea of co-evolution, which doesn't have to be a competitive predator-prey relationship, it can also be bees and flowers, for example. But I did it as predator-prey because that seemed to work the, the simplest for the kind of approach that I was using. And it's basically when you have two or more species that are interacting in a way, uh, in the case of predator prey, as I'm showing in this example, you have crabs and snails. The crabs like to eat the snails. The snails don't like to be eaten by the crabs. So the ones that survive are the ones that have spinier and thicker shells. And of course the crabs don't like that. So the ones that survive are the ones that have stronger claws to be able to break those shells. And so this process continues ad infinitum as long as, as those two populations stay more or less in balance. If you don't want them to go out of balance, because for example, if the crabs are too good and they eat all of the snails, they have nothing left to eat and so they die out. Or if uh, the snails are too good and all the crabs die out, then they don't really have that competitive relationship. And so they don't continue to improve over time. So in order to do this kind of thing in a post-processor environment, you do have to uh, spell out exactly what this sort of process looks like. So this flow diagram demonstrates that. So again, you initially initialize the algorithms, predator and prey algorithms. You evaluate them, find out how good they are. Uh, I keep uh, a top 100 list of the best performers. So it doesn't really matter when you stop it. You always have the best performers available. Uh, the preys seek food. Uh, and the predators seek to prey, and then some bad things happen. But the ones that survive are the ones that produce the next generation. And the ones that survive are the ones that, if you tie it to performance of the algorithms, are better performing algorithms. And so you keep going through that cycle, and so you keep getting better and better performing algorithms. And the reason I started doing this was is I wondered, based on some results I'd done with some earlier studies, uh, you get this kind of structure. If you look at the bottom of this figure, you'll see three snapshots in time of this evolution. This is without the predator-prey behavior. Uh, and what you're seeing here is uh, populations of predators who are the red and prey who are the blue that are aggregating over time. And it's just through the natural evolution, this ecosystem domain. So this 100 by 100 space is not physical space, it's this mythical ecosystem space where the algorithms are evolving. But you see these clusters developing. And so I wondered if in this predator-prey environment, you would actually get something where that competition could lead to more diverse solutions than you'd get otherwise. So instead of just getting better performers, you might also get better ensemble performance with more diversity in the ensemble. On the top, Part of this figure just so shows cycles that are forming. Uh, so the again, in this case, 
the green are the prey and the red are the predators. And so you see these population numbers that evolve in a sort of phase lagged situation. So basically what happens is when you have few predators, then the, uh, the prey expand in population numbers. As they expand, the predators begin to expand too because they have more food available and that starts to collapse the prey population. So you get this phase lag cycle. This is something that was shown many, many years ago by ecosystem biologists, and they're called the lotka volterra equations. So this system actually produces that same behavior, but it does so in this sort of ecosystem uh, uh, domain rather than through a set of partial or ordinary differential equations. And so I wanted to look at what the impact of this coevolution was compared to a sort of a standard process that I was using. And so on the right-hand side, you're seeing the rank histogram for the baseline model. And again, this is a post-processor on a reforecast. And so we had 21% 21, 21 excessive outliers uh, on the outside bins, outside of what the, the uh, ensemble was producing for the, um, the uh, reforecast ensemble. And then if I use my sort of standard uh, evolutionary programming technique, that's the one on the far left. So you see a, a collapse in terms of that U shape, but it's still there. So you have about 4.7% excessive outliers. So you improve that performance quite a bit in terms of the ensemble. And then if you do the coevolution, it goes even further, reducing those outliers by, again, at about 50% to 2.2%. So it actually improved both the deterministic and the, the uh, probabilistic performance of the system for that particular study. And this was for temperature forecast, which is the best behaved kind of uh, weather forecast variable. And I also showed that you can do this on a domain. And so this is a domain, a real domain, the CONUS. And the, the darker greens are the best performance. The lighter shades are the worst performance. And one thing you'll notice is that there are some places where it doesn't perform particularly well. And if you look closely, you can see that those tend to be places where there are local topo topographic or other orographic features, like on the coastlines, over the Great Lakes, uh, over the mountainous regions. And that's because the resolution of the reforecast ensemble is not very good. And so it, it doesn't reproduce those characteristics as well as uh, would otherwise be the case. And so it needs to pick up those characteristics. So if you had better uh, resolution data, you could probably do better than this. So this all led to thinking about adaptive approaches. And with ecosystem dynamics, you might expect that you could do something adaptive. After all, ecosystems are adaptive. And so uh, I published a paper on this first in 2019, where we're looking at the coevolution stuff, but then the adaptive application of that in 2021. Uh, and the motivation is because of the time delays in developing post-processing algorithms. So typically, it can be several years between the time a new model, let's say, or a significant model upgrade happens, and the uh, post-processes are updated to reflect those improvements in the models. And so you want to be able to, to cut out some of those, those time and implementation delays associated with collecting the retraining data sets. So if you can do this, ongoing and an ongoing basis that would be a big improvement and so as a first step i looked at this in a hypothetical scenario on the right hand side is ed lorenz's famous uh, general circulation model not as famous as the 1963 paper but it's what he called the simplest possible general circulation model which is three coupled ordinary differential equations and it produces a complex attractor structure which you're seeing in the three dimensions uh, on the right-hand side. And then he later, in his 90s, published a paper where he showed that you can actually couple a whole sequence of these three equation systems and have a much higher dimensional system as a result of that. So on the left, I'm showing that same type of scenario, but with nine ODEs instead of three. And you can see when you project it on the three dimensions, that it now looks like just a mass of points. It doesn't really have that characteristic structure. And that's because you're collapsing a higher dimensional system down to three dimensions. And so you're not really reflecting what the higher dimension is when you do that. 
So there are a number of different things that I did in evaluating this. I won't get into all the details, but basically we're forecasting the five day eddy uh, amplitude in this system. I start with an initial fixed training period and I let it evolve with a moving window of two years of data after that. So you're only keeping two years of data online while you're doing this. And the whole system evolves as that data evolves. And what we wanted to test is, can you incorporate that better information by doing it this way, rather than have to stop the whole system, collect a retraining data set? And so that's what we're showing here. Basically, the vertical line at 2920 represents the start of a new model, which is an improved model, has higher skill. And instead of having to retrain, you just allow the adaptive system to incorporate that information. We find within about 47 forecast cycles in this example, the error, root mean square error, is reduced by 25%. So it actually does incorporate that information relatively quickly. That's the, the dark black line. The other one is the change in the uh, uh, artificial neural network structure as that's going on. And so the number of hidden nodes are changing both as a reflection of changes in the the uh, climatology, so to speak, and also changes in the model background. So it actually adapts to all, all of those things. And so again, it was just, in this case, the adaptive uh, system uses artificial neural networks as the individual algorithms rather than if-then structure. And the reason I did that is because it's easier to uh, quickly incorporate the information with the neural network than it is with sort of the if-then structure. I had to do kind of an ad hoc approach to do that with the neural, with the uh, if-then structure. With the neural networks, with the error back propagation, you can do it relatively quickly. And I show also that the adaptive model is better, that no training is re required, and it does incorporate that new information relatively quickly compared to, to other systems, like uh, standard multiple linear regression is one example. <clears throat> so one question that I had was, given that machine learning approaches typically take a lot of data to retrain well or to train well, uh, the question I had was, how does this compare to multiple linear regression in terms of the data that was required, at least in this application? And I found that it really didn't take any more data than the multiple linear regression did. Both of them do better as you give it more data, not surprisingly. But within about giving it about two years of data was sufficient to actually get pretty good performance. When you had shorter amounts of data, it didn't do nearly as well. But as long as you gave it sufficient data, it could do it as well as multiple linear regression, which was a nice finding. Now, having said that, the uh, caveat is that this is, even though it's a higher dimensional system and it's nine coupled ordinary differential equations, it's still not the real atmosphere, which is infinite dimensional. And so the next step is of course, what do we do in real system? And so I'm, I have a project through CIRA right now where I'm working with the Meteorological Development Laboratory, laboratory to look at uh, an adaptive MOS approach as a first step in looking at the uh, national blend of models and doing something with that. So, so we're starting out with that. I've got some preliminary results, which are pretty good as far as temperature forecasts, and we're expanding that out as time goes on. I also wanted to talk a little bit about this, which was a study I did, uh, I think it was three years ago maybe now, uh, looking at prospects for machine learning activity in the weather service. You wanna read all the details. There's a publication in the AMS Bulletin that came out a few months ago about that. But basically what I did is I went around mostly by uh, virtual because this was still during COVID, I think, um, <clears throat> and uh, talking to a number of different people, including Greg Mann sitting right there. Uh, about uh, applications that are currently being used in the weather service and plans uh, going forward in terms of what they might want to do. And one of the main objectives of this approach was really to think about what the obstacles in the weather service are to future progress uh, in making those kinds of advances. And I also talked to academics and private sector folks. And I just wanted to mention that Sometimes this is forgotten because a lot of people doing machine learning stuff really have a background more in computer science rather than in the discipline that we operate in. And really all these machine learning applications uh, are balanced on what I call a three-legged stool, which 
includes the technical skill. You need to have somebody who understands how to do this training properly and what the kind of structures are. Uh, and the data, of course, fundamental to it. If you don't have the right data, if you don't have enough data, you're not going to be able to do a good job with it. But also the domain expertise, because you could have people who have the data and have the technical skill and develop an application that really doesn't isn't very useful in the context in which it's supposed to be used. And because there's often inside knowledge that domain experts have that allow you to refine the way you're developing that application, it's very important. And so obviously these kinds of approaches really demand collaboration between people who bring all those different kinds of expertise to the system. And if you look at where machine learning applications are being developed, the best ones are where they have teams of people who are working on these together. Uh, and I like to, to point this one out also. It's a famous statement, variously attributed. Even Yogi Berra gets that, but I don't think he said it. Uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And what we know from meteorology is that's definitely the case, that you can always find some problem in any particular model forecast, but they can be very useful in giving you some insight, even when they're wrong, in terms of what's likely to happen. And so machine learning applications are just like this. It's just another form of guidance uh, tool. Uh, and actually, uh, there was a nice study done by Mariah Keynes uh, at UCAR, and she was interviewing forecasters and finding out you know, what their approach to machine learning tools were. And basically, it's the same as other forms of guidance. They need to have some experience using that uh, to get some, some time to build trust in it and to understand what its pitfalls are and to really understand it better. It's a little bit more challenging in a lot of ways with machine learning than other approaches because it is nonlinear structure and we don't have the same kind of tools typically that we use, let's say, for diagnosing a dynamical model. So you can understand physically what's happening with that model in a way that's a lot harder with machine learning. So that's an active area of research is to develop those kinds of tools so you can understand machine learning uh, applications. This is especially true when you're talking about uh, post-processors and other forms of guidance. Uh, it's perhaps less true when you're talking about AIWP, which if you're not familiar with that's artificial intelligence weather prediction. So the big splash from, from Google and other places doing those kinds of models. It's maybe possible to diagnose physically what's going on in those models. They are just pattern recognizers, but it, they may be able to learn some of the physics. There's some early evidence that it does do that. It's very early at this stage and other studies have to be done to show that that's the case and that it, they can be used that way. So again, an active area of research and something that others including myself, are looking at. Uh, I just wanted to mention this is an example. This uh, came from uh, Dale Duran's group at University of Washington. His was one of the first papers that actually talked about this approach to uh, weather forecasting, so to do a global model using machine learning. It's basically a form of convolutional neural network, deep learning model. Um, and uh, they showed that even with relatively limited uh, structure in the model, they were getting pretty good results. Since then, there have been a plethora of uh, other models that have come out, mostly from private sector entities. And as we were talking about earlier, they're very big about the splash and not so big about actually following through and showing what they can and can't do. And that's a big risk. Uh, unlike uh, people in academia and the Weather Service who are very interested in knowing about those details, Private sector entities are mostly interested in getting a big splash over it and getting a lot of attention. And so they're less interested in doing the kinds of things that we need to do to understand what these tools can really do. So there's an active effort in that area as well to understand what the strengths and limitations of these approaches are. Um, <clears throat> another example of agent-based modeling that I worked uh, with my grad, then grad student, Austin Harris, who's now at NCAR, um, was an agent-based modeling framework for looking at hurricane forecast evacuation. This is a good example of where the natural science and the social science meets, because when you're dealing with hurricane evacuation, you've got the forecast side of things, 
you've got the warning side of things, but then you've got how people respond to all that information and what the context in which they're responding to it is. And so we looked at a Hurricane Irma type situation and we built uh, systems that involved risk perception by people receiving those forecast storm factors, the quality of the sheltering op uh, options available to people, uh, kind, kinds of uh, um, sectors that people are coming from, so their availability for resources, those kinds of things, and then eventually leading to a model that actually produces an evacuation decision, which maybe yes, maybe no, maybe tried to, but couldn't get out. And uh, so we looked at different scenarios. I won't go into the details here either, other than to say that we looked at multiple risk factors, not just the storm force winds, but actually flood threats, et cetera, et cetera, storm surge. Uh, and so we looked at this sort of rectangular Florida-like peninsula uh, with economic data and social science data built into it to get a sense. The Hurricane Center was interested in this model as possibly a training tool for them. It's obviously not at the resolution you would need to actually use in the forecast context, but it was interesting because it showed us some, some uh, results that were sort of unexpected as you might expect in a nonlinear kind of system. So this basically showed that we could reproduce what happened in Irma pretty well. But what we also found is that under different scenarios, it sometimes was uh, less effective to issue evacuation orders earlier than uh, let's say the standard time. So you might think the earlier you can get the evacuation order out, the more people you can get out. But it turned out that in some contexts that didn't happen because people were getting out in places ahead of where the major population centers were. And that led to traffic slowdowns. And so people actually found out that they couldn't get out or got frustrated and went back home uh, rather than and to, to ride it out because they found the traffic was so bad getting out. So these are very subtle kind of things that can happen that an agent-based modeling approach can sort of bring out that you can't see using other approaches. So I wanted to finish up uh, just talking about uh, water balance. So a number of years ago, uh, I was looking at, at Lake Michigan water levels and basically looking at, at sort of from a budgetary standpoint, uh, standpoint of water budget income and expenses. So the income is precipitation over the, lot, the lake, runoff into the lake, expenses are evaporation and outflow, and of course, inflow into the lake as well as uh, income. And so we're neglecting diversions, groundwater, and thermal expansion, but you get the big picture results from that. But one of the issues with this is, so I've super superimposed a, a mid-latitude cyclone system with its precipitation pattern over the Great Lakes Basin. And I just do this to show you that the, bay, the lakes are not independent of each other from the meteorology. So a typical synoptic scale pattern is gonna affect multiple lakes simultaneously. And so you can't really model them independently. And so I built a model where we had these basin correlations taken into account. There's a fancy mathematical technique for doing that, a bunch of different equations to predict all of these different uh, uh, income and expense contributions to each of the lakes and was able to show for the uh, those are the equations which we I will ask you later about Lake Erie what that equation looks like. Um, here's the results. Uh, so basically this is just for the Lake Michigan Huron Basin and what I'm showing is the uh, horizontal dotted line is the average lake level and I'm showing different scenarios where the top and the bottom bar and the bar chart are the extremes and the red circle is the average over 50 year time periods. And so the, the first one on the left is the actual historical record. I can't remember now when this ended, but it was uh, sometime around the record low that we hit, but it was a 50 year period up to that time. And then the, the second one on, on the left is the simulation from the model I built. And it shows it reproduces pretty well that variability, it's a little bit low in terms of the average level, but not too bad. And so then I wanted to run scenarios of future uh, conditions. So 
I've just binned them here into four different scenarios based on regional climate simulations, where the next one is very warm and very wet conditions, or very warm and just wet conditions, or warm and very wet conditions, and warm and wet conditions. And what you can see right away is that the average level might or might not drop depending on how wet it actually is in these future climate simulations. But the variability in every instance increases a lot. And the reason for that is because you can get situations where you have coupled seasons together, years together, where you might have periods of very wet conditions leading to rapid rises in the lake levels, but you can also get uh, drought conditions that can last over many years as well, or very warm conditions leading to increased less ice cover and increased evaporation. So all of those things accumulatively can lead to these much more variability in the lake levels than you'd otherwise get. Uh, this was pretty good, but I wasn't satisfied with it because I really wanted to do all the Great Lakes together. And I found that this model did well on the upper lakes, Superior and Michigan, but not so well on the lower lakes. Erie and Huron, uh, Erie and uh, Ontario were problems. Uh, I also looked at long run simulations of this. So this is a relatively simple model. You can do like a thousand year simulations and get some characteristics of the spectra. And so we see some evidence with with uh, this climate change that you get a shift towards higher frequency, meaning simply that those variations from lower to high levels could happen more quickly than it did in the past. So there was some evidence from that that was true, at least for Lake Michigan. But I wanted to build a whole Great Lakes model, as I mentioned. And so I thought, you know, here's a, a possibility where machine learning could actually work. And so if I model all four Great Lakes simultaneously using machine learning model and drive it just with precipitation and, um, and winter temperatures, because the uh, subsequent summer temperatures we've shown are, are actually going to be very strongly correlated with the winter temperatures because of the ice cover. And so if you just drive it with those two things, maybe you can get a decent model for the whole Great Lakes. So I did that. Again, this is the results from neural networks that I produced. And so we're doing these individual uh, models for evaporation and for outflow and for changes in the lake level as a result of that, driven again just by those two entities, the amount of precipitation and runoff over each individual basin and December, January, February average temperatures over that time period. So relatively crude inputs, but we got fairly good results. Unfortunately, you will notice that one of the least performing ones, if you look closely, is Ontario, the changes in the lake level. And that turned out, I won't go into this either. This is just one way of, of analyzing um, the response of the model to different inputs. So there are lots of different ways of doing this. So you can look at how changes in one particular variable, given others being fixed, lead to changes in the output. And so it's a, a one way that you can address this uh, to understand it. What I really wanted to point out was this figure here, which does show up reasonably well on the screen. And basically, because I wanted to show all the lakes simultaneously, I had to do a different axis to Lake Ontario than the other lakes. But all three of the other lakes are on the left axis and Ontario is on the right axis. And the solid lines represent the, uh, the actual observation and the dotted lines represent the predictions. And they all work pretty well except Ontario. And so what's happening with Ontario? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I've been looking and I haven't been able to figure it out. So if anybody has any ideas about that, I'd love to hear from you. I know there are folks here who do a lot of work in this area, so perhaps you can give me some insights. But I found that there was a particular period from looks like the, the late 60s to around 1980 where there was this offset that occurred. And up until that time and after that time, it was okay. But it was during that one particular time period where it seemed to, to actually have a problem. I looked at outflow independently. I looked at inflow from Erie. And none of those actually really seemed to point to the problem independently. So it might have been some uh, accumulation of those errors across several different fields that are doing this. But again, if you have any ideas about that, I'd love to hear about it. So I will stop there and address any questions you might have.
Any questions? So uh, thanks for the talk, really interesting stuff. I think I followed most of it. Um, the The model at the end, um, it sounds like you were just using EVAP and Precip as your inputs, right? Uh, not evaporation itself, no. Oh, okay. Just, just December, January, February, average temperature and precipitation runoff over okay. the each basin. So for precipitation, I guess, um, it just seems like there's a lot of uncertainty in that. Yeah. Does, your, does your model account for that or is there any, do you have any insight as, as nope. to how to? No, okay. I, I used the GLURL uh, inputs for all of those. So it was a, about a, from 1951, I think, forward. I'm not using lake ice directly because it's a shorter time period. So that has to be something that gets produced based on December, January, February okay. time periods. So that's obviously a source of error as well. But what's interesting is it does so well with, with most of the lakes, but not Ontario, which right. I can't figure out. And I thought at the beginning you had said that you were modeling the system as a whole so that you're right. But then you showed the individual time series because it, uh, the output. So the neural network model is doing all of those simultaneously, but the outputs are for all four of those links. Oh, OK. All right. Thanks. I have thoughts on Ontario. This is um, but first a question, are you like your um, regional, your climate inputs, like your temperature and um, precipitation, are you looking beyond the Great Lakes region or, okay. And the reason I ask is because <clears throat> Ontario, well, there's a lot of complicated things about Ontario, but one <laughs> is that uh, the outflows can be impacted by the Ottawa River flow, which is a huge basin. Um, you know, so like some of the spring discharges could be impacted or spring spring discharge of, of the Ottawa River can influence like the regulated outflow of Lake Ontario, even though it's downstream. So that wouldn't be captured. So that may be part of it. Um, I guess I think it's just going to be hard to to use only climatic variables for the Great Lakes to to simulate Lake Ontario. Yeah, it's another option. beginning to look that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could you could integrate like regulation and routing modeling right. to. And my original model, I did do that, um, but it still had a problem with Erie and Ontario. Yeah. So I'm not sure that's the solution entirely either. But yeah, that's interesting what you're saying. Do you know if there's something in particular about that 10 or 15 year time period that? Would suggest that the regulation of outflows started in the um, 60s. Hopefully, I got that right, or, or 50s. So, thank you. Yeah, 1958. Okay. So, like, you're so going to well see a that. big change in the variability at that point. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't explain that particular time period. Oh. Oh, no, that's okay. I, just a comment. I enjoyed that a lot. And it, it, because I'm an old guy, I think old things. And I, I remember when in the 70s, we started getting numerical weather prediction on a regular basis, and somebody decided they could do a better job if they did a statistical correlation between the model output and the observations of wind and temperature. And they had a technique called MOS, Model Output right. Statistics. Yep. And I just thought back to that and we're at a whole nother level of using model outputs, but to uh, um, improve them by uh, looking at the data as well. So. Yeah, I and mean, that's absolutely true. And in fact, we had a group who was talking about that before the seminar where we think the big, biggest leverage still for AI and ML is in post-processing. So, you know, multiple linear regression, which is what MOS is, is has some advantages, uh, but it doesn't capture, at least easily, nonlinearities. And so where there's that little bit more that you want to get, that's where we might be able to get it. So back to the corner. Um, so with your adaptive network, neural network, um, the training data, it looks like there you kind of hit 
a glass ceiling with as you keep adding more data um, as it's moving along. So you have, it's so it's self-informing for a while, but it seems like that there's maybe some critical mass on the learning aspect. Are you then building within the the AWN at like okay, there's still some rules of engagement for like how like which how many nodes you activate. You could see it kind of dance around a little bit as it was, you know, self-informing its its format. Um, yeah. Is there is there some things under the hood that we're not aware of there? Oh, there's a lot under the hood. Um, <clears throat> so a couple couple of responses to that. First of all, when I published the paper, one of the reviewers was asking about the training approach because initially the way I did it was to have it continually adapt the number of nodes and other hyperparameters. Uh, which are some of the things like uh, the learning rate and stuff like that. And um, they wondered what would happen if you froze those after the training period and just let it go. And it turned out it actually was a little bit better to do that because it learned enough from the training period not to need to fiddle around with those other parameters. So that's one thing that I've changed since then. So not having to, to adapt those parameters after the training period. And I think you know the models are changing and hopefully getting better, but basically it's the same dynamics and things like that. And so you wouldn't expect it would necessarily need to change those kind of things in the machine learning approach, but it will need to change the weighting of the information and things like that as the models increase. And it shows that you can do that. Now, how much data you need to do that is going to tend depend entirely on the complexity of the system you're trying to simulate. So there's no hard and fast rule for that. So I found for the Lorenz system with nine equations that somewhere between two and five years was plenty. Um, but for something else, I'm not sure, I can't answer it, it just depends. And a lot of this is kind of like that, where you, there are a lot of things that you have to do just through experimentation and you don't know offhand, there's no theoretical answer for those kinds of questions. Other than sort of guidance rules, like the more complicated it is, you're probably gonna need more data. The more that you wanna capture outliers, it may help to have more data because you have a larger sample. You'll have to change your training criteria if you do that so that you can enhance its ability to capture those outliers. So, you know, these are all things that it's, the one thing I always say about this is it's not magic. <laughs> So don't think it's going to immediately be the answer to all your problems because it's not going to be. It may give us some advances and advantages for certain contexts, but it's going to depend on the context. I hope that answered your question. Discussion. And uh, maybe I want I I would like to know maybe the audience also uh, wish to know the differences and similarity between AI, machine learning, deep learning, or uh, neural network. Uh, this kind of the uh, terminology. So so yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of different notions floating around about what what is what what's the difference between ai and machine learning computer scientists have a very precise definition of the differences which i've never found particularly convincing i i found and i said this to a computer scientist that i think it's just rebranding that back in the 80s knowledge systems and ai started to get a lot of attention and some really big promises were made that didn't materialize and so it got a bad name. Uh, and so then it sort of died, died down for a long while. But then uh, some smart people came up with a way of setting the weights for neural networks. And so that, that back propagation technique really led to some massive improvements in the ability for neural networks to actually learn the data. And once that happened, all the rest of the stuff started taking off. So there are lots of iterations and variations, deep learning, uh, is mostly what people think about now when they're thinking about machine learning, but it's basically convolutional neural networks, which is a particular type of network that has many, many layers in it. For a lot of situations, sort of standard neural networks, networks like the ones I was showing, 
You don't need a lot of layers. In fact, typically one layer is more than enough if you have enough nodes in that single layer. So there's still a lot of variations in that as well. Uh, so I think uh, machine learning today is AI. It's the same thing, really. It's just a rebranding of that, and everybody's excited about it now. I hope not overpromising again, like we did the last time. But I do believe as long as you're careful about it and do quality verification of what you're doing and pick the right context for using it, there's a lot to be gained from it. And there's clearly, we've already shown that in a lot of contexts that there's good things about it. But if you think about generative AI and stuff like that, you can see all the problems in it too. I, I uh, for chat GPT, I gave it uh, what I call it the, uh, the uh, Kafka test, which was, I told it a prompt to, to write, write the first paragraph of a story about a man who wakes up as a bug, which you may know as metamorphosis. And then I compared it to the first paragraph of Kafka's Metamorphosis. And it was interesting because it was completely literal. Like it, it sort of described a man waking up as a bug. And it was kind of like, oh yeah, okay. Uh, and then you read Metamorphosis and you felt like you were the guy waking up as a bug. And there was a huge difference. But that's, you know, that subtle difference between what someone really creative can do with something like that compared to what machine learning at this stage at least actually is. There's a big difference between the two. So the human in the mix is critical, I think. I, I read that book as a college freshman. <laughs> it, was, it took me a long time to figure out that it was that he was a bug. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, having done anything with, uh, with machine learning, uh, but we're talking about doing things, right? But what what I hear is it's a black box, and you can't get at what's happening inside. And and the inputs, what's what what are the primary inputs? I mean, can you do something like a sensitivity analysis? To, okay, nod of the head, yes. Okay, that's yeah, my I mean, question. that's actually my favorite approach <clears throat> is to do a sensitivity analysis. And I got started in using our uh, neural networks sometime in the late '90s. And I did something on snow to liquid water ratio. And that's exactly what I did, a sensitivity analysis to show how it was responding to different changes in the inputs. I still think that's the best way. People are trying more sophisticated ways of doing it. And there are a number of different approaches. I haven't seen any that I'm totally convinced that are any better than sensitivity analysis, but it's an active area of research. So I don't think they're entirely black boxes, but they're harder to interpret. We are going to have a lunch again, so garden. If uh, someone wishes to join us, please uh, come. And uh, we have a group discussion for the uh, Hulong, Michigan Hulong, from 3 30 to 4 30. Also, welcome to join us. If I don't get home,